Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 113. In this episode, I interview Nick Nikolai. He has been on the podcast once before, episode number 76, where he talked all about carbon. Nick is the owner of Rooted Leaf Agritech and has been gardening for over 25 years. He has advanced knowledge in plant science, and in this episode, he breaks down the science in regards to many gardening myths that you hear, or bro science that many gardeners implement in their garden in order to try to achieve a better result. This one is awesome. It is the longest episode yet and packed full of good information. Get your pen and pads ready because you may want to take notes for this one. If you want to see highlights of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That channel is dedicated to short, bite-sized clips of these podcast episodes. I also have a gardening channel with over 130 videos showing the plants that I grow. I'll have that channel linked down in the description section below. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. They now have humidifiers called the Cloud Forge. I've been using the Cloud Forge T3, which has a 4.5 liter capacity and can be filled from the top. It also includes a hose, so you can place the humidifier outside your grow tent and feed the hose into your grow tent, saving you precious space. It also connects to the Controller 69 Pro, so you can control it from your smartphone. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about their humidifiers and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. I've been using Stash Blend for over a year now and it's awesome. One of the things that I really like is that it saves me money. It's a whole bunch of different inputs in one. So I no longer have to go out there and buy a silica bottle, then a separate seaweed bottle, beneficial bacteria, then a separate one for mycorrhizal fungi. All of that plus more is in this one blend. Go to stashblend.com to learn more about it. And I also have a link down in the YouTube description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Nick Nikolaev from Rooted Leaf Agritech. Did I pronounce your name right? Yep, Nick Nikolaev. Yes, got it. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, man. How are you? Doing good. It's your second time on the podcast. Uh, the first one was a fan favorite. 261,000 views so far. Incredible. I think it's up there. It's got to be top five. Top five garden talk as far as number of views. You talked all about carbon and just so much knowledge bombs were dropped in that episode. If you're listening to this episode right now, haven't tuned into that one, you're definitely going to want to tune into that one after this one. I'll definitely have a link in the YouTube description section below so you can easily get to that one. This one, this one's going to be good as well. Can you introduce yourself for the audience members who don't know you? Sure. Yeah. My name is Nick. Nice to meet you. For those of you who we, uh, who I haven't talked to, and certainly I'm looking forward to hearing from a lot of people that I've already spoken to. Um, I'm the CEO of Rooted Leaf Agritech. We're a carbon-based fertilizer manufacturer that's based in Washington State. And um, we've been in business since about 2019, and we've really developed a kind of a unique platform for manufacturing fertilizers. And the idea with what we're trying to do is treat carbon like a macronutrient. And in the cultivation of most crops, um, food crops and medicinal crops, it makes a lot of sense to keep carbon as the number one most important thing that you as a grower should be focused on. And obviously in the first episode that we did, um, I dive into great detail about that. So I would highly encourage and recommend people go and check that out if you want a deep dive into why carbon is the most important macronutrient by far. Yeah, we even did an episode on From the Stash quite recently, and that one blew up. Tons of value being dropped. I'll link that one in the description section as well. Just so much good information coming from you. And you hook up my viewers with a discount code. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That's still active. Discount code Mr. Grow It on your website, rootedleaf.com. I'll link that in the description section below as well. So if you're interested in picking up some newts, carbon based newts, use that discount code. Get a little bit of, save a little bit of coin there. Yep. Yep. Mr. Grow It gives people 20% off. Um, rootedleaf.com. Check it out. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, tell us on Instagram. I'm usually the person that answers the messages. So if you guys want a little bit more technical information than what you find on the website, which we have a lot of really good information on the website about our products. We're very transparent about what we're doing and what goes into each product. But um, certainly I'm open to discussion about uh, you know how much further the rabbit hole goes or how much deeper it goes. So yeah, check it out. Mr. Grow It. Use the coupon code. Sweet. 
So today's topic, this is going to be a fun one. I've actually done this similar style uh, on a couple different podcasts in the past, and pe- people love it. We're going to be talking about bro science, things that people deem as bro science. And really, there's there may or may not be science to back it up, but we're going to go through a whole bunch of things here today, and uh, it's going to be fun, man. I'm excited. Me too. I enjoy the sort of the rapid fire approach too, and being able to answer a, a whole bunch of seemingly disconnected questions. And by the end of the conversation, we'll actually have a, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, the individual pieces, once you start to make sense of it, you kind of see the big picture. And that's what I want to try to help people understand in their gardens is how do you get the most out of anything that you're growing, whether you're growing roses for competition, or you're just trying to feed your family and grow some tomatoes and lettuce in the backyard. Hopefully there's going to be some good content and some of the um, myths, misconceptions, truths, and half-truths that we'll look at today will help enable enable people to get better results and achieve a greater level of success. Yeah, and you have a lot of knowledge in biochemistry, right? So like the chemical processes that happen in living organisms. And to be honest with you, biochemistry is one of those things that go over my head. <laughs> and uh, I think it probably goes over a lot of people's heads. It's, it's just so, so complex. And you do such a great job of grasping onto it, understanding it, and then relaying it in layman's terms for the audience. So let's start going through some of these questions. And uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of things that relate to biochemistry that you can be bringing up here. So first up, grow light, sunrise and sunset feature. So it's often said that, hey, replicate nature. Nature has a sunrise, they have a sunset, there's a light spectrum in there that's different for both of those. That's what's best for the plant. So grow lights now have a sunrise and sunset feature. Now, Dr. Bruce Bugby, shout out to him, he actually did a study in regards to the rate of photosynthesis for a sunrise sunset versus just turning the lights on full blast. And he had mentioned the plants were able to take it full blast. So that's one thing that he kind of uncovered there in in one study. Of course, studies need to be repeated in order for it to be true fact, blah, 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 so on and so forth. But sunrise, sunset feature, is there any benefit to this or not? I definitely think there is. I think when you're trying to get a holistic expression of the planet, it makes sense to consider that some of the light energy coming in during those early morning hours or even in the late evening, um, you know, it's not primarily used for photosynthesis. There are wavelengths of light that come in and they just kind of help spread a certain kind of message in the plant so it can kind of start to express different things, maybe do things like close the stomata. Um, At nighttime, certainly this is true. Um, you know, typically when studies are done on things like this, what they're looking at doing is just measuring one variable. And in this case, it would be, let's say, quantum yield or the, the photosynthesis overall in the plant. And when you take just that narrow slice out of the rest of the plant and what the rest of the plant is doing, um, you know, it becomes a little bit more clear. Like, yeah, I mean, plants will take in the amount of light energy that you give to them. And if you just full blast turn on the lights right away and then just turn them off at nighttime, if you're only measuring photosynthesis, um, you know, you'll see the results skewed from that perspective. But if you're looking at things like gene expression or even the migration of the phytochromes from the outermost layer of the leaf where they are during the daytime to a little bit closer in the nucleus of the cells at nighttime, there's this physical migration. So if you took a cross section of a leaf and looked at it from the side, like a profile shot, you'd find that the leaf is very dynamic. The the, um, chlorophyll and most of the pigments that absorb light energy, those are going to be close to the outer layers of the leaf, right? And as you get into the deeper layers of the leaf, more of that light has been filtered out. And of course, on the underside of the leaf, almost all of the light has been filtered out. And the only thing that's really coming through is a little bit of green light. That's why, you know, plants look green effectively from the underside. They also reflect a little bit of that wavelength of light too. But, um, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there are physiological processes that happen that have been uh, fine-tuned over the course of millions, if not tens or even hundreds of millions of years. Um, plants are very used to the rising and the setting of the sun. And there's nuanced things that happen that have to do more with gene expression and kind of like the big picture of what a plant is, as opposed to just like, hey, photosynthesis, you know, quantum yield and carbohydrate production, and Calvin cycle, these things are just like tiny components, very important components, don't get me wrong, they're kind of like the primary engines, but you have all these accessory things that um, get tagged along with it. So I do think that, you know, natural sunrise and sunset um, really are going to just help create a better expression in the plant overall. That makes sense. Now, what if this grow light just simply tunes up the amount of light and doesn't change that spectrum to truly simulate sunrise and sunset? Would you say that's kind of a a wasted feature or would you still see that as being valuable? 
Um, yeah, I, I think there could be value to it for sure. Um, you know, I think to replicate perfectly what the sun does kind of depends on where you are, so to speak. Like if you're, you know, in the southern hemisphere, northern, if you're high altitude, for example, you might get more UV light exposure on those plants versus a lower altitude, you might get less. So there are differences for sure. And there's no such thing as a light that can truly really replicate the full spectrum of the sun. I mean, the sun, the sun is just um, you know, it operates on a fundamentally different principle. No one really has like a nuclear reactor that's powering their grow lights. They oftentimes have LEDs, which are totally different in terms of the mode of operation, you know, or they have high intensity discharge like metal halide and high pressure sodium lights. Th those things are fundamentally different um, than what the sun is and how the sun puts out, you know, different wavelengths of energy and really that full spectrum. I mean, it's not just the visible light spectrum. It's you know, infrared, for example, the planet is heated by the sun as well. Um, so there, there are things to consider outside the context of just what the plant is capable of absorbing for the purpose of photosynthesis. Got it. Really good points there. Now, how about the 24-hour light cycle? There's lots of folks who say that uh, the plants don't need a resting period at all. They can just blast it with 24 hours of light and the plant will grow better than if they were on an 18-6 light cycle, for example. People on the opposing side say, no, plants do need a resting period with the lights off. There's also talks about the, you no, know, not just the plants having a benefit from the lights off, but the microbes in the medium as well need that resting period. What's your take on that? Yeah, and I think it kind of stems from the same um, issue overall is when we're looking at things from just that scientific perspective, it tends to, we, we get this very narrow slice. And so photosynthesis is like a car engine, for example, and all the byproducts all the things that you want your plants to produce, <clears throat> all the wonderful aromas and fragrances and flavorful compounds and things like that, those are driven by light, um, but it's much like a car engine. Yes, you get more horsepower if you leave your car running for 24 hours a day, but in reality, sometimes you have to let that, you've got to turn the engine off so that the accessory belts and everything else doesn't like get burned out and get worn down. Um, the same thing is true for plants as well because they've evolved to capture energy from the sun during the day. And then during the night, they're not necessarily uh, inactive. It's not like the plants go to sleep. They're actually still very metabolically active. And a lot of the activity associated with plants at nighttime revolves around taking the sugars that they've produced throughout the day and doing things like maybe maintaining their own internal temperatures, maybe feeding some beneficial microbes and fungi. Um, there's also something to be said about um, the stomata and the way that the water flows in the plants. This is maybe a little bit more minor of a difference but you know when the when the lights are on or when the sun is out plants are taking up water from the roots and transpiring it from through the leaves um, when the lights turn off and the sun sets the stomata on the leaves close and so you have this reversal of a pressure gradient meaning that the water from the roots is no longer flowing up like it is when the stomata are open when they close actually what ends up happening is the roots can actually secrete organic acids and all the byproducts of photosynthesis during the day the roots will actually push that stuff back out into the surrounding medium, which is the rhizosphere, that narrow like one to two millimeters just outside the root hairs. And it's this secretion of the root exudates that attract the microbes, attract the fungi. And that's really where the plant can kind of modulate its relationship with those microorganisms to help optimize the chemistry of whatever's going on. Um, so, you know, it is important in my perspective to maintain that that synergy with what plants have been doing for so long anyways, because a lot of times when you start hybridizing plants, particularly those are that are grown in indoor controlled environment kind of scenarios, you know, they get really sensitive to certain types of environmental stressors. I mean, yes, you can run your engine 24 hours a day, but the moment you flick the timing belt, the whole thing just snaps and breaks apart. So this is similar to how certain, you know, crops when they're grown indoors in controlled environments, you you know the the stability of them tends to go down over time so if you have like a dehumidifier in the room for example and it puts off a blue light just a tiny tiny little amount of light that can be enough to trigger something in the plant that makes it become stressed out and and give you different results than what you're looking for maybe you know the plant starts to um go kind of down this path as opposed to the other path that you want it to go down so these things typically don't happen in nature because there is a moon out there in nature and even during a full moon a lot of the genetics that are just like wild growing um, they don't respond negatively they don't have these stress responses they don't have their photo periods disrupted by the tiny tiny little amount of light that the, the, the moon reflects so i feel like a lot of the sensitivities and a lot of the instabilities that have been created over time have been 
artificially selected for, so to speak, because a lot of people don't understand what they're doing when they run their car engine for 24 hours a day. And then they wonder why the belts are starting to get worn down and everything is starting to break. And it's just wear and tear, you know, that type of thing. So what's your personal recommendation for light cycle for the vegetation stage and then recommendation for light cycle for the flower stage? Well, it depends on where the gene pool comes from. I think if you're growing something, you know, closer to the equator, they can handle longer uh, periods of daylight, shorter periods of, um, you know, the dark, dark period. Um, But if you're growing something that's maybe a little bit more northern or a little bit more southern, probably something closer to like 18.6 would be pretty good. You know, 18 hours on, six hours off. Um, you know, in some cases, 20 hours on, four hours off. I do think that there's a real benefit associated with having that dark period for regardless of what you're growing or how you're growing. And I, I do think that there's a, a benefit and a value associated with that dark period. Um, but the, the it is a little bit, plast, you know, there's some plasticity because it also depends on how much your plants are capable of handling. If you give them really, really good airflow and the VPD is always in that perfect spot and the soil chemistry is just right. And the light intensity is perfect, but not too much. Plants can cruise along at that optimal spot for a lot longer versus if you have the lights just a little bit too intense, they quickly become saturated. And maybe, you know, if you have your lights on for 18 hours, you might start to notice right around 12 to 14 hours, your plants almost look like they're not sad, but they start to like get a little droopy or like they're getting ready to go to sleep because they're kind of reaching that point where the equilibrium is being thrown off and they're kind of. Um, trying to catch up to the stress rather than straying, staying ahead of it and being able to deal with it. So when the leaves droop towards the end of the light cycle, are you saying that there is an indication that something is wrong or is that a natural thing that happens with all of these uh, medicinal plants is they'll droop down before the light cycle naturally? Um, in some cases, it could mean that it's too much light. Yeah, you'd, you'd want to take a look at the you know visual morphology of the plants to see if you have any burned leaf tips. You know, that's a, that's a big one in particular with plants. If the transpiration is a little bit off and they get stressed out, um, if they are a little bit too dry, for example, you know, they'll tend to have those burned leaf tips. Um, and it could be a, a sign of too much light intensity. I would say to some extent it is natural for the plants to want to go through those day and night cycles, just like plants want to go through wet, dry cycles. You know, they like being really saturated, lots of water available, but only for a very short amount of time. You know, most plants you can't grow fully, so the roots cannot be fully submerged. They can be exposed to a large amount of water, but for a short amount of time. And then they kind of go, the pendulum swings the other way, and they start to, the soil becomes much drier, for example, and the roots start to dry out. And these wet-dry cycles are very um, advantageous to plants because it allows them to balance their chemistry and their metabolism out. I think the same thing is true of day and night cycles, for sure. The plants do have this tendency to kind of go back through and, and create a balance in that swing. Um, if you optimize the grow environment and you optimize the chemistry of the plants, the leaves will typically not, um, droop like that. They'll stay kind of nice and perky and active. Um, and so you can, in those situations, you can push the plants a little bit harder, maybe a higher light intensity. Um, but you know, it's also true that plants have circadian rhythms. A lot of these plants are really looking towards the, not only the, um, you know, exposure to the sun itself, but also the duration of the day versus the night as a mechanism or a trigger for that flowering process. And it can also factor in temperature as well for certain um, plants like hops, for example. Um, You need to hit particular temperatures in order to actually initiate um, flowering in hop species. Got it. How about darkness before harvest? Uh, This is something that a lot of folks have done over the years. I've heard benefits, everything from more trichomes are produced, secondary metabolites, ripening. There's so many different things that are said in regards to giving your, per- your plant a period of darkness before harvest. Is giving your plants a period of darkness before harvest beneficial at all? Mm, I would say largely probably not. When you look at the underlying mechanics of how um, certain compounds can be produced, like the monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes, things like that, um, you know, THC, CBD, all of these compounds, they're very energy intensive compounds, which is why they require exposure to direct light. You know, if you're growing some of these plants in a, you know, like far away from the light under low light intensity with low pressure and low stress overall, you're probably not going to get the best results. But if you have a high intensity grower environment with high intensity lights, that light energy is directly what feeds those biosynthetic pathways. And so by cutting out that light energy entirely, you're actually directly bottlenecking the process. And instead of creating a, 
a greater throughput in that particular pathway. You, you might stimulate the plant to respond in a particular way, but it's not going to be the, the type of response that's fundamentally hardwired and linked to the light energy coming in and then being utilized through a very complex process, obviously photosynthesis first, and then the sugars being transported, broken down, and then you know the, the terpene synthase enzymes acting on them and polyketide synthase enzymes acting on them too to create all of tolic acid. Um, these things are fundamentally driven by exposure to light, so I would say that it's a little bit of a misconception or a myth. However, there are um, examples of you know some compounds that might be produced by the plants, which create a little bit more rounder or nuanced experience. Maybe this is more for people who are connoisseurs and aren't necessarily just seeking a high concentration of active metabolites, but they want that broad spectrum of metabolites. Um, there could be something there, but it would be largely a personal bias more than like an objectively true thing. Um, I think it's objectively true to say that you would probably um, see a decrease in the overall concentration of some of these metabolites, particularly because, again, they're biosynthesis and accumulation is tied directly to the light energy that's coming in. And if you break that, no way. Got it. That makes sense. And just a quick note, a lot of these questions actually came from the audience. So shout out to those folks that have followed me on Instagram at mr.growit. That's the only account I have on Instagram. Just a FYI, there are a lot of impersonator accounts on that platform, unfortunately. But I asked this question about what garden myths they've heard or bro science things and tons of people had submitted things in. So this is kind of like a consolidated list of uh, not only things that people have submitted in, a couple of them I have thought up, a couple of them you had actually mentioned that you wanted to talk about. So um, just wanted to mention that there. And some of these questions have been asked to other guests in other episodes in the past, but definitely want to get Nick's insight on these as well. So another thing that people do before harvesting is they flush their plants, run water through the medium, or they will simply cut off nutrients. They won't feed nutrients for the final one to two weeks before harvest. Some people go even longer than that. Um, now, there have been a couple studies on flushing. Arc Screen Technology study comes to mind for me where they really found no difference between flushed and unflushed buds. Give me some insight on your end. Does flushing your plants before harvest provide any benefits? It's a little bit of a myth and a misconception. You know, if you think about how things work out in nature, plants don't necessarily have a choice to stop taking things up. It's really about how they metabolize the various elements and how those relate to carbon metabolism. In the first episode that we did, we had kind of tied all of the macronutrients like the NPKs and the calciums and magnesium, so on and so forth, um, to what plants are trying to achieve, because all of it just ultimately comes to carbon metabolism. And I really feel like a lot of growers are leaving yield and quality on the table if they're cutting nutrients out too soon, because this whole flushing process is a little bit of a misconception from that perspective of you're going to get an increase in potency or you're going to get an increase in quality. Um, that's generally speaking, not the way it works. Um, and then even furthermore, if the goal is to flush some kind of residual salts away from the roots to prevent them from being taken up or whatever, um, it would actually be a beneficial practice to incorporate a small amount of um, some potassium that has organic acids associated with it, because those organic acids can directly participate in these types of salt binding and detoxifying processes that I think a lot of growers seek when they add just plain water into the medium. Um, the other thing to consider too is that the constant flow of some of these minerals working their way into the plant is very, very important for that long, uh, for that long-term sort of stability of the, the, the flower or the, you know, the whatever product it is that you're, whatever plant it is that you're trying to grow. Um, getting a little bit of calcium, getting a little bit of potassium in with every single watering is going to help with certain things like gene expression charge conductance and if the plants are doing you know photosynthesis during the last couple of days um, or even the last couple of weeks of their life um, a lot of the carbon that flows through the plant from photosynthesis plants are looking towards some of these minerals to help create a little bit of a charge balance between them so potassium is actually a really good one to talk about in that uh, from that perspective because if you feed potassium to your plants during the mid to late stages of flowering you're actually increasing the overall appetite that the plant has for taking CO2 out of the air. And this directly, and, you know, in conjunction with light, obviously, this directly impacts the overall production of terpenes and um, other compounds that people might want from their plants. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Ice flushing. This relates to what we just talked about with flushing. Now, ice flushing, for those that don't know, is really just taking a bunch of ice, dumping it on top of the medium before harvest, letting that ice melt 
cold water down in the root zone. And it is said that this actually stresses the plants into making more secondary metabolites, trichomes, for example, and it also brings out purple color. Is there any truth to any of that? Yeah, I would say that the anthocyanin, which is the purple pigments, you know, the biosynthesis of them can be tied to um, exposure to cold. And I think part of what it has to do is like plants have membranes that are that are like uh, phospholipids. And if you've ever taken a glass of cold water and added a drop of oil into it, the temperature of the water forces the coalescence of the oil. So you get this like distinct blob or drop of oil that floats on top. Um, whereas if you have a glass of warm water and you drop oil inside of it, that oil could disperse a little bit more evenly across the top. So it tends to like stretch out and it tends to not just clump up together like this, you know, um, when you put ice on the soil and ice flush your plants, really what you're doing is exposing them to cold temperatures that create a sort of brittleness, if you will, with the phospholipids, because again, these are, these are phospholipids, they're oils, they're, they're, you know, fats basically. Um, and the plant's defensive mechanism is it doesn't want that fat to kind of coalesce like that because for their cell wall membranes, for example, or for the integrity of these membranes, it's really important for them to be able to kind of stretch out and maintain that adequate reach that they have across the, the full volume or surface area of, of wherever they're located. Um, and so anthocyanins, which are those purple pigments, can be produced by plants because they'll kind of modify the properties of those phospholipids a little bit. They'll allow them to be exposed to colder temperatures without necessarily becoming so brittle and cracking, if you will. And that's um, that's an important consideration. But um, ultimately, I think putting I, you know the ice water flush thing, I think it can actually do more harm than good for a couple of reasons. One is that any time that we're talking about that purple pigment being synthesized, those anthocyanins directly compete for substrates um, with, you know, like CBD and THC and some of these other molecules. Um, there's a competition between the two of them. So you have a building block that either gets diverted to make a purple pigment or it gets diverted to make something called oliftolic acid. Um, and there, there's a little bit of crosstalk between them, so they kind of get balanced out. But the idea is that plants are taking in CO2 from the environment around them. And the real question is, where does that carbon go? Because if the carbon goes towards making a purple pigment, it could have instead gone towards making a monoterpene or a, a sesquiterpene or maybe some CBD um, or other cannabinoids. Um, and so it becomes a little bit of a problem in that context. The other reason that it could be an issue is because when you have really cold temperatures uh, in the feed water, you know, if you're exposing your plants to that, it's the flow of energy coming in through photosynthesis. Typically, that energy comes in and you want to get your plants to express all of those wonderful colors and flavors and aromas that you possibly can. But when you expose your plants to low temperatures, what ends up happening is that energy actually gets diverted away from the production of secondary metabolites, and it instead becomes uncoupled from ATP generation. And there's something called thermogenesis, which is just generation of heat. You know, the, the practical sort of application here might be like every time that you eat a meal, you might notice your body temperature actually goes up a little bit. Um, and this is possible to measure. I think it's been done a number of times. But when you eat food, your body's breaking that food down and it's releasing that energy just as heat because your body needs to maintain a particular temperature in order to operate efficiently. Homeostasis is what this is called. So maintaining the optimum temperature to allow all the enzymes in your body to function, all the proteins to work properly. And, and really, you know, you don't want cold and brittle joints. Like some people might notice this if they have really sensitive joints. When the temperatures go down, the joints become really stiff. And the joints become really sensitive. And this is part of the same phenomena in plants, meaning that if they're exposed to cold temperatures that are below their threshold, instead of taking that energy from the sun and producing compounds with it, they'll take the energy from the sun and produce heat with it. And the goal of producing heat is to raise the temperature of the water that they've been exposed to so that it becomes sufficient for their basic operation. And that's always just an energy tax placed on the plant. So I would say ice flushing is probably not um, very beneficial. It does slow down total transpiration in plants. It does decrease the availability of nutrients. You know, if you've got a cold glass of water versus a hot glass of water, you can fit a lot more sugar inside of that hot glass of water. You can add teaspoon after teaspoon and keep stirring, and that hot water will dissolve all of that sugar way more effectively than a glass of cold water is going to dissolve that same amount of sugar. And plants are faced with the same problem. They take CO2 out of the air and they're trying to create sugars. And in order for those sugars to be properly dissolved, inside of their own tissues, it requires the water to be at a particular temperature. And plants are very heavily invested in maintaining that 
um, temperature, you know, mark because they don't have the ability to just put on another layer or, or a jacket if they get too cold or they can't like stand up and walk somewhere else where it's a little bit more ideal. They have to deal with the environment that they're exposed to. And if that environment is cold, their primary focus becomes let's generate heat. The secondary metabolites are useless without a functional a cell to begin with. You know, the, the primary purpose at that moment in time is going to be for the plant to take the energy from the sun and create heat, which is a problem when you're trying to create colors and flavors and aromas and all these things. Another thing that's doing is it's really slowing down your microbes, right? The lower the temp, the slower the microbes function. And if you're relying on the microbes in order to break down organic matter and uh, cycle nutrients uh, so the plant can uptake it, well, you're kind of slowing down that process by adding ice water into your medium there. I personally, what I usually do to bring out the colors towards the end of flowering is I'll just lower the ambient temp, you know, the, the room temp into the low 60s, high 50s degree Fahrenheit. And that, uh, that usually does help bring out some of the colors. I would think that might be a better approach to bring out the colors if that's kind of your goal is to kind of get some colors out of it, doing that route instead of doing the ice flushing. Yeah, yeah. And there's that antifreeze sort of mechanism that we talked about too. You know, just dropping the temperatures a little bit will um, create a little shock in the plants and they have a vested interest in not only um, offsetting the temperature changes, but also producing compounds that can help them deal with or mitigate that kind of stress. So um, that's where the purple pigments start to come in. They, they can modify the way that some of these compounds behave at really low temperatures, like those those fatty acids and those oils, which tend to just kind of clump up and come all together. This is not an ideal state for all of your cells to be in because you want your cells to take up a large surface area. Large, You want that plasticity. You want that cell to be able to kind of move around and expand because there's always water coming in during the day. The vacuoles fill up as the roots take that water up. So you want the cell to be able to expand and then also to contract once the water leaves the vacuole and then gets destined for photosynthesis or for transpiration. But this constant like water pump phenomena where the plants are swelling up as they fill up with water and then they're kind of shrinking back down as they um, as that water leaves the vacuole. You want to maintain this dynamic with plants and at really cold temperatures the outer layers become very brittle and it becomes difficult for the plants to effectively expand without cracking the uh, you know outer layers of the cell walls and they don't like that because, you know, it starts to create oxidative damage. It starts to, you know, destroy the cells and the organelles. So they produce these purple pigments that modify those phospholipids. And even at low temperatures, now the plant can properly go through this expansion and contraction process. Good info. Let's move right along here. Next up, we have stem splitting. So some people actually split the, the stem or, or the stalk during the grow. Typically, it's a little bit before harvest in order to stress the plant into producing more trichomes. Does that actually work? I don't think so. Um, you know, it kind of depends on what flavor of trichome we're talking about. There are a, a couple of different ones. Um, you know, there's the ones that have heads on them with the stalks. There's ones that have just the stalks with no heads. There's ones that are just the heads sitting on the surface of the leaf with no stalks. And then there's some that are non-glandular trichomes that are either phytolith uh, deposits like if you grow cucumbers or if you grow tomatoes, those pokey little um, spines that go all up along the stalk, and particularly for some varietals of cucumber, they can actually form on the fruit itself. Those are cystoliths if they're calcium carbonate deposits, and they're phytoliths if they're some kind of uh, silica deposit. So for plants that take up a lot of large concentration of silicon, zucchini and squash are good examples of plants that can do this. They'll actually secrete those and make non-glandular trichomes, and those serve defensive purposes as well. So I would say if you're talking about in the context of glandular trichomes, the ones that have the stalks and the heads, it's probably not going to increase the biosynthesis of them. There are a couple of studies that are coming out that particularly done on like hops for lupulin glands, then also on lavender buds, which produce a large, large concentration of linalool and myrcene, you know, osamine, camphene, these terpenes might be quite familiar. Um, to your audience, you know, lavender buds, it's been shown that um, there's a phenomena that happens in the early stages of flowering where, and, th and this may not be true for all plants, but effectively the idea is that the plant is in the first two to three weeks of flowering, the plant's trying to figure out which of its trichomes are going to be the ones with the heads and with the stalks coming off of it. And it starts to dedicate resources really early on because plants are master mathematicians. They're really, really good at doing math and they're really good for planning ahead. They're always trying to build uh, an understanding of what's right around the corner, you know, because they're trying to build up 
stockpiles of energy so they can deal with changes in the environment and things like that. But all this ultimately to say that the presence of these, um, you know, the, the bulbous, the capitate stocked trichomes is what they're called, but the ones that have heads on them, the decision to make those is made several weeks in advance before it actually extends off the leaf surface and becomes an actual stocked trichome with a head on it. So the plant's trying to plan and, and try to figure these things out pretty early on in the process. So to do it just before harvest um, doesn't really give the plants enough time to adjust properly because in, as far as the expression goes um, of the plant, you know, they make these decisions several weeks in advance before it actually happens. That's why I think focusing on what happens in the first two to three weeks of flowering can actually set the plants up for success for the second half of flowering so you can get the best possible results. Um, and to you know answer the question more directly or more specifically, I, I don't think that it would be directly connected to an increase in yield or quality. You may see some terpenes come out, or not terpenes, I'm sorry, you may see some trichomes come up, but those may not be the ones that become concentrated in oils. Those may be more defensive compounds like the non-glandular trichomes or even the ones that don't have heads, they're just the stalks that come out. Yeah, because the trichome can form, right? But in, in order for it to get that potency, it takes a little while, right? Well, what's the uh, timeline on that? Like when a trichome was formed, typically you hear about going from clear to cloudy to amber. What's the general timeline for that transition? Well, it kind of depends on, I mean, it could take several weeks. Um, you know, the transition between, uh, particularly when you're going from like cloudy to amber, it's really the when the color starts to form inside of those trichome heads that there's an indication of some change in the chemistry. And sometimes what could be happening is the compounds that are inside of that trichome head could be um, starting to oxidize. And as they oxidize, the color will change a little bit. And a lot of growers will look at this as a sign of maturity, like the plant is ready to be harvested. Um, there are certainly cases where, like if you feed the correct things to your plants, if you have a dialed-in fertilizer program, your plants will inherently be able to resist that oxidative stress. So they may develop those trichome heads more rapidly in the first, let's say, half of flowering. They're going to like develop them a lot faster, and the flowers will grow out a lot more. But then when the trichome heads themselves are starting to, to become a little bit more cloudy and milky, they'll hang out in that transitionary space between being clear and being amber for a lot longer. So they'll resist the degradation associated with that that ambering effect you know they'll go through the first half really rapidly but then for the second half it takes them forever seemingly forever to finish up and to um, properly oxidize so you see that color change happening um, a lot of what happens inside of the trichome heads as far as like the change of you know the constituents and what those molecules are inside of there those are driven by non-enzymatic processes meaning it's not something inside of the plant that's actually causing this discoloration it's actually an environmental Stressor, and I think it, it makes sense to pay attention to certain plants, like hops, for example. It's a really good example of a plant with um, it has bracts on the outside of the flowering cone, and then the lupulin glands actually face inward. There are other plants, um, tomatoes may be a good one as well, where the trichomes actually pointed out. You know, if you look at the the stalks and um, leaf surfaces of tomatoes, you'll see that those trichomes are actually exposed to the to the surrounding environment. Um, that's an important consideration too, because when you're just exposed to the out outdoors with no protective sheath, like hop cones have, that the bract itself is an actual physical sheath that protects it, you're more likely to get oxidative decomposition just because it's exposed to the air. You know, that's good to know. All right, moving right along, this next one is actually from a viewer. I got a little scenario here. Shout out to Cannabis420. He is on my forum. He posted this, mrgrow.com slash forum. Head on over there if you want to connect with some people, like-minded people who grow, get a lot of home growers, indoor, outdoor, some commercial growers pop on there, but feel free to stop by mrgrow.com slash forum, sign up to that, and feel free to share your grow, or you can ask questions in there. But Cannabis420 posted about carbonated water and whether or not it's beneficial. So I'm going to read off his scenario here, and then uh, you can give me some insight on it. So he had mentioned that he uses carbonated water to water his plants, and that carbonated water lowers the pH drastically to 4 to 6 pH. He had to up the pH to over 10 pH to get close to his liking. So he dumped a bunch of pH up in there and uh, was wondering if that's safe to use. Also wondering when the carbonation wears off, will the water's pH shoot back up to 10 pH? 
So I might have read that a, a little bit wrong, but basically he's seeing these pH adjustments with adding carbonated water in there. So can you give us the, some insight on carbonated water, whether or not it's beneficial to use within the grow? Yeah, carbonated water is not beneficial to use in a grow. There's a couple of reasons for this. The primary reason is that carbonated water contains CO2, and CO2 inside of the water likes to not stay in the water, so it goes up and out of the water. Um, so these swings in pH actually follow this equilibrium between carbonic acid that's dissolved inside of the solution or the liquid phase, and then the CO2 that's being spontaneously off-gassed. This is actually why, this is the same exact phenomena why if you open up a can of soda on a hot summer day, well, first off, all, all carbonated beverages are pressurized. And the reason that they're pressurized is because if they're not pressurized, the CO2 wants to leave. In a normal atmospheric setting, just like outdoors uh, or even just sitting inside of a living room, because we're not in a pressurized environment, anytime that we have CO2 present inside of a liquid solution, the natural default tendency is, or the default state is for that CO2 to escape back out into the atmosphere. So... Um, this is why the pH swings, because initially you have a high concentration of carbonic acid that's present, um, which lowers the pH. And then if you just let that you know, can of soda or, or carbonated water sit out for long enough, it will eventually go completely flat. It'll still have, you know, it'll, it'll be mildly acidic. But um, the point is that the CO2 doesn't want to stay in there, so it doesn't really serve a benefit to the plants. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that the, the oxygen that's present, that's attached to the carbon, is what um, creates an energy draw on the plants. You know, they have to use the power of the sun to break that oxygen off of the carbon. So it's not like you're doing the plants any favors by watering in CO2. It'd be better to have, instead of the oxidized carbon or the one that has the oxygen, it'd be better to have reduced carbon, meaning no oxygen inside of it. Things like organic acids are a really good example of this because they already have that power, that energy is already kind of built into the bond um, that the molecule has with, you know, the carbon-based molecule has a particular amount of power that's stored inside of it or energy that's stored inside of it. Um, the other thing to consider, too, is that oftentimes carbonated water can interact adversely with minerals, like calcium, for example. You can start to form bicarbonates, bicarbonate residues in the soil, and the buildup of bicarbonate can actually be quite harmful. This is why when you look at applying things like oyster shell meal or crab shell meal or any kind of shell meal that's a calcium rich, even, even eggshells from chickens, they have the same problem of the carbonate there is not very conducive to plant biochemistry, nor is it conducive towards soil chemistry. And a lot of times it's just kind of like it binds up and ties minerals in a way that makes them less available for plants to take up. Um, bicarbonate residues can also drive the pH up as well. This is why oftentimes I see well water that it has a high pH. Well water can be alkaline. The pH sometimes can be eight or nine because there's calcium in the present, you know, calcium is present inside of that well water, but it's specifically in the form of calcium carbonate or calcium bicarbonate. You know, there are these various carbonate, um, you know, molecules attached to the calcium or the magnesium or the potassium that make it a little bit less soluble overall. So it could be a little bit of a problem more than it is a, a good way to deliver carbon to the plants. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, I actually have a lot of bicarbonates and actually a lot of sodium in my tap water and that increases my pH. And uh, I didn't really know the impact of it at first. I mean, I tried to use my tap water before, you know, I wanted to be more uh, eco-friendly here using the tap water instead of uh, having to use RO, which does produce some some wastewater, which I actually use that in my outdoor garden, so I'm not truly truly wasting it. But having the sodium and bicarbonates in it screwed up my plants, so I'm never using those ever again. I am forced to kind of filter it out. And I feel like bicarbonates kind of sneak in people's regimen, in, in a sense, in their source of water, right? So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that and called that one out. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of that dovetails perfectly into a question about, you know, like adjusting the pH, I guess you could say, you know, is that what what would you use to adjust the pH obviously, you know, it's an important consideration. Um I do think that in some cases like for your water in particular if you have a lot of calcium carbonate or even sodium carbonate um particularly if it's high in calcium, you know, the the least effective way to adjust the pH is going to be by using a phosphoric acid based or a sulfuric acid based pH down. And the reason for that is because if you have high calcium dissolved in the tap water or in the well water, and you're putting a large amount of phosphorus or sulfur in with that, <clears throat> you're going to create calcium sulfate, which is gypsum or drywall, or you're going to create calcium phosphate, which is what your bones are made out of. And neither one of those two forms of calcium is very soluble. 
So what you're doing is taking the calcium that's naturally present in the water and exposing it to a compound that decreases the availability of that calcium. I would say it's a much better idea to use something like vinegar to adjust the pH because that particular um, form of calcium, calcium acetate, is significantly more soluble. It's like thousands of times more soluble than the calcium phosphate and the calcium sulfate. So for every drop of vinegar that you put in, you could be increasing the availability of calcium significantly for the plants rather than decreasing it. The other thing to consider too is that a lot of the interactions that organic acids have with carbonates is one that they'll attack chemically the carbonate bond itself that that you know the carbonate is bonded to a cation and they'll attack that bond free up that mineral and effectively chelate it or complex it and then the bicarbonate gets off gas to co2 because of that chemical attack if you will that uh, the proper ph down like a vinegar based ph down would be able to afford um, most of the vinegar out there that you buy at the store is going to be around three to five percent acidity if you're dealing with a really really hard well water it might be beneficial to find something stronger they do make like an 80 percent acetic acid solution sometimes it'll be called glacial acetic acid um, the stuff is very very concentrated you know phosphoric acid is interesting because you can open up a bottle of 75 percent phos acid and smell it and it smells actually kind of sweet it's not unpalatable but if you try to do the same thing with 80 percent vinegar you're going to burn your nose your eyes are going to burn you're going to cough and it's just not going to be a good day so I would recommend to people to use vinegar if they're dealing with water that's high in calcium, but find the appropriate strength. If it's 3 to 5%, that's perfectly fine. It's going to work great. Nice little benefit there, too, is that any kind of excess organic acid, excess vinegar, is going to get rapidly metabolized. It's a really, really good food source for beneficial microbes and fungi. In fact, acetic acid residues or acetates are the most common metabolites in all of nature. Everything has an acetate associated with it at some point. Everything that microbes do um, dovetails perfectly into acetate-based chemistry, and same thing with fungi and plants as well. They all utilize very, very high concentrations of acetate. So it becomes very difficult to throw the equilibrium in the soil off. It becomes very difficult to burn the plants. You could easily overdo it with something like a sulfuric acid or a nitric acid, phosphoric acid. You know, you can really damage, um, if taken too far, you can really damage the physical and chemical properties of the soil plus the biological qualities of the soil but the same thing is much harder to achieve when you're using organic acids like vinegar it's so difficult to put too much in obviously you, you'd have to like really go overboard but you know um, point being ultimately that there's a huge buffer range as far as what's safe and what's acceptable i'm gonna have to switch to vinegar after hearing this one yeah because that was one of the questions is a lot of growers swear that using some sort of organic or all natural ph adjuster is better than using like phosphoric acid, for example. Lemon juice was named. You had already talked about vinegar. Baking soda was also named. So you would generally recommend for that for folks to go after those sources versus synthetic sources. I would say in most in almost all cases, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. Um, and keep in mind too that you know the organic acids, like the if you're using lemon juice, for example, or if you're using uh, vinegar. Those types of acids are quickly metabolized by almost all organisms on this planet. Um, this is a really important consideration because when plants are exposed to high concentrations of these acids, they can take them up and they'll just burn them as extra fuel sources. It's not a problem for them to intake, you know, pretty much everything that you throw at them and to be able to actually properly metabolize it. Plants have not evolved similar mechanisms to deal with high concentrations of phosphoric acid because it just doesn't exist out of nature like there's no such thing as phosphoric acid out of nature anywhere but there is such a thing as vinegar and acetic acid and citric acid and ascorbic acid which is what you're going to find inside of lemon juice which is vitamin c basically citric acid is a little bit different i think a lot of people associate citrus fruits with citric acid and certainly citrus fruits produce some citric acid but they primarily produce a different kind of acid called ascorbic acid which is vitamin c and that's the chief organic acid that they produce but um, ascorbic acid is useful in plants. It's actually a fundamental in all plants that are grown anywhere on earth. Ascorbic acid is one of the fundamental non-enzymatic antioxidants inside of a plant, meaning if you knock out ascorbic acid and you just prevent the plant from having it, there is no such thing as a plant cell anymore. It can't function without ascorbic acid. It's, it's fundamental to the existence of a plant. So of course it makes sense if you supplement organic acids like vitamin C to the plants that they naturally have a very 
uh, sophisticated way of dealing with it. They they can funnel you. They break. They can take it in, break it down, and then funnel that energy towards any number of things. But that's not true with sulfuric acid or nitric acid or phosphoric acid. So you'll find that the tolerance that your plants and your soil and your microbes have for vinegar are significantly greater than you know for phosphoric acid and some of the synthetic pH downs. Um, I would avoid using baking soda if possible because baking soda is typically um, it's a it's a carbonate or a bicarbonate, um, and that could kind of create some some issues overall. So. Now, can some of these pH up, pH down sources kill off microbes? That's a common thing that people had mentioned. Like, hey, if you're using these things, they're killing off microbes. Now, obviously, in their raw form, right, isn't vinica used as like a cleaning method? It's like it's supposed to kill off microbes. So like in its raw form, it'll do harm. But people worried that when you're using pH up and pH down just in water, it's still harming microbial life once you're actually pouring that into the medium is there any truth to that or is that just bro science mm, for the purpose of the dilute feed water that you're applying to the plants it's not really going to harm the microbes in fact like nitrates for example which i think a lot of people associate with detrimental effects on soil biology nitrates are very common they're a natural source of nitrogen um they get produced by microbes they get produced by you know thunderstorms when there's lightning that goes through the sky that intense heat that plasma that's generated breaks dinitrogen gas bonds apart in the atmosphere and if there's rain it'll take that you know nitrogen that's been broken apart and solubilize it and rain down some nitrates that's why plants actually look you know after a thunderstorm the air has a particular smell and plants may look a little bit more perky and a little bit more green and it has partially to do with the fact that there's soluble nitrogen fertilizer being created as a part of this natural process so nitrates are very very natural um, when used excessively, I think they can throw equilibriums off in soils, and it takes a long time to actually, you know, destroy the soil biology because the soil bio biology will do everything that it can to stay alive. Um, if you're talking about like the specific mechanism of action for oxidizers, which are like you know potassium hydroxide based pH up, I mean, yeah, they'll break down cell walls, they will completely denature DNA, and they'll cause irreversible damage to anything that it touches, plants, fungi um microorganisms even humans shouldn't be exposed to potassium hydroxide but again for the purpose of creating di dilute feed water um usually it's not measured in that kind of way um you know potassium hydroxide is used to make soap and last time you washed your hands with soap it didn't cause a chemical burn right so the way that something is ultimately processed informs how it's going to be metabolized or how it's going to be accepted into a system um, I would say if you're just dosing your plants with just straight pH up or pH down, um, that's going to cause some serious damage. But again, when you're talking about the tank of feed water that's made that you're going to apply to your plants, usually that tends to hang out in a pH range that's mostly acceptable. And the concentration of nutrients is also um, pretty universally accepted for all plants and all microbes and all fungi. You may notice a decrease in the overall activity of certain like fungi, for example, that are known to help plants access phosphorus in phosphorus limited conditions this is one of the benefits that um you know beneficial my uh, beneficial fungi can bring into the garden but if you're not deficient in phosphorus that one little pathway could get turned off but there's other benefits associated with having that fungi there you know there could be some stress response or stress related um, benefits there could be some disease suppression benefits fungi produce all kinds of wonderful antimicrobial compounds antiviral compounds these can be useful for plants um, outside of just their ability to help fix and make a little bit of phosphorus more available to the plants. Got it. And you kind of touched upon the next question here a little bit, but I'm going to ask it again in case there's anything else that you can add to it, which is synthetic nutrients killing off microbes. Now, it's often said that mineral-based or synthetic nutrients, salt-based, is going to cause a high saline environment that's going to kill off the microbial life in the soil. Now, some people say that that's true. You know, a lot of organic gardeners, they avoid bottled nutrients because of that. And other folks say that that's false, that these microbes are able to withstand the high salinity environment down in the root zone. What's your take on that? I mean, I think soil microorganisms are capable of living in environments that um, are pretty intense. I think there's some evidence to suggest they can even survive on comets that have been 
you know, maybe not comets, but like some spacecraft that have been launched to outer space. I remember there was a study that was done on water bears. Tardigrada was the genus, and they had launched them into outer space, basically, and noticed that, you know, the intense radiation outside of the atmosphere of the Earth, um, these water bears were capable of surviving and, and actually reproducing. So um, in some cases, I think the same thing is true of fungi and microbes. I think there's even a theory out there that suggests that either beneficial microbes or fungi you know, once came from a different planet and they somehow survived on a comet that smashed into the planet and that's how life started or spread. So if you just look at the uh, ability of these microorganisms to survive in extremely harsh environments, it becomes clear that, you know, a little bit of ionized fertilizer isn't really going to damage them sufficiently enough to kill them. Um, I would say in most cases, the microbes themselves have the ability to resist those types of stressors if you will and then also keep in mind that anything that really directly benefits the plant the microbes will find a way to dovetail into that operation because their primary interest is in getting sugars from the plant right so they form these beneficial relationships the plant will photosynthesize and produce sugars and even if you're using a synthetic fertilizer as long as the plant is healthy and it's growing it's very likely that the plant is capable of also supporting beneficial relationships in the soil too so that's a major consideration um i will say that there are um, physical and chemical changes that can happen to the soil depending on how much organic matter is going to be present inside of a feed program, I guess you could say. If you're just feeding pure salt-based fertilizer with no organic matter whatsoever, no humic acid, no sea plant extracts, no terrestrial plant extracts, just salt-based fertilizer, over time the introduction of high concentrations of these elements can start to strip away at the organic matter. And it's really the loss of the organic matter in soils that's tied to a decline in the populations of beneficial microbes and beneficial fungi. So if you can focus on building up that healthy soil chemistry, effectively what that means is that you're building up the supply of carbon available for those microorganisms to thrive on. And if, that, if anything attacks that directly, like you know nitrates and other um, salt-based compounds, that come in through, you know, salt-based fertilizer programs, those can actually start to directly impact the concentration of organic matter. And as that decreases, so too does the populations of beneficial microbes and fungi. But as far as the direct link between, you know, the salt-based fertilizers and the viability of beneficial microbes and fungi, I think it's a little bit more disconnected. Like there's, there's other layers of stuff that you have to work through in order to get to that downstream effect of, yeah, this damaged the soil biology. Well, how did it damage the soil biology? It stripped all the carbon. Um, it removed everything that the microbes depend on for life, basically. And, you know, that's ultimately what ends up happening. Got it. Yeah, I appreciate you expanding on that one. I still, I mean, I've been working in the industry here since 2015, and this is something that has been brought up since then. And still to this day, people still bring it up and still want to talk about it. So appreciate getting your insight on there. And Given us some uh, some additional information. So these next couple ones on the list were actually uh, submitted by you. Something you want to talk about? First up, let's talk PK boosters. Give us your insight on those. I think there is a little bit of a myth associated with PK boosters. I think people overutilize phosphorus without understanding exactly how it's going to get metabolized in the plants. And the important thing to remember is that most phosphorus in the well, maybe not most, but let's say half of the phosphorus, roughly, that you apply to your plants. Is going to get recycled in the plant. It's not going to just get sunk into some, like calcium, for example, get sunk into a cell wall. It kind of hangs out there and it doesn't really interact with the rest of the plant once it's been deposited. So plants naturally have a very high appetite for calcium. They can take up monster quantities of it because they know there's a terminal sink. They can just shove it in a cell wall and they don't have to deal with it. So if they get a little bit more than what they actually need, it's perfectly fine because they, they can always find a place to, you know, put it into and, and make a new cell wall out of. Um, but for phosphorus, because it's primarily recycled in plants, where it becomes a constituent of membranes, um, which are also more or less like fixed, you know, they, they, they don't um, regenerate or they don't require as much replenishment like calcium in cell walls does. Um, this being the case means that the optimum concentration of phosphorus to expose your plants to is actually a lot lower than a lot of growers think. And I think according to the research articles that have been put out there, most plants will do well with about 30 to 50 ppms of elemental phosphorus. What you see on the labels is actually not elemental phosphorus. It's phosphorus expressed as P2O5. 
So there's a little bit of a conversion factor. How do you go from P to P205? There's a number you multiply it by. I think it's like 0.4364 or something like that. But, you know, a quick Google search for those of you who are interested. Just type in conversion factor P to uh, P205. You know, do that. And then you'll find a calculator online that will allow you to convert it. But basically 30 to 50 ppms is kind of the sweet spot for most plants. And to give you guys some context, in the vegetative stage of growth, where your plants are taking in a large concentration of nitrogen, you can feed upwards of 150, maybe closer to 200 parts per million of nitrogen. Compare that with 30 to 50 of phosphorus. Um, potassium, you can feed in some cases, I've seen you know in excess of 400 parts per million, probably closer to 500 parts per million. Compare that with 30 to 50 of phosphorus. And then same thing with calcium. Calcium can be fed in massive concentrations, 200 plus ppm is no problem. And again, phosphorus clocks in 30 to 50. So in a lot of cases, I think when adding too much of a PK booster into the soil, really what you're doing is encouraging the tie up between the phosphorus that's needed in low concentrations and the calcium that's needed in high concentrations. And this is why during the mid to late stages of bloom, plants tend to slow down, they get yellow, the disease pressure start to creep in, things like um, molds and mildews, botrytis, these things start to become uh, disease pressures for plants, not because of anything to do with phosphorus directly, but rather a lack of calcium that's caused by excess of phosphorus fertilization. It's also worth mentioning that because phosphorus doesn't have an actual sink for most plants, I mean, it, it does if you're growing for seed, right? If you grow some flowers out and you want those flowers to actually be pollinated and to develop a seed, the actual seed itself is a good sink for phosphorus. So you can, if you're growing for seed and you want good viability from those seeds, it makes sense in that context to do a little bit of a PK boost, particularly during the seed formation stage, because then the plants will take up the extra phosphorus and they'll actually sink it into the seed. But if you're growing just the flower and you don't want any seeds, the overall maximum for phosphorus is going to be much lower because, again, there's no seed and so there's no sink for the plant. This is an important consideration. Okay, let's move down the line here. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We definitely passed the hour mark by now, but a lot of good information. I'm going to hit you with a few more here, and then I'll let you go. Foliar sprays, or foiler spray, I think some mm -hmm. people pronounce it foiler, some people pronounce it foliar. <laughs> Either way, tomatoes, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Spraying with the lights on versus lights off. Now, some people say there's harm in mm -hmm. spraying mm -hmm. with the lights on. Other people say it's going to be fine. What's your take on that? Um, it depends on what it is you're applying to the plants, and it depends on the nature of the chelate itself. I will say um, it's worth paying attention to what happens in a tropical rainforest where the sun is always out and it tends to rain quite a bit. And it seems like tropical rainforests are pretty uh, diverse in terms of the total number of plant species. So these are very, very biodiverse regions. There's a huge number of plants that are growing, and they've kind of evolved these mechanisms to deal with you know, the, the sun and rain being present at the same time. Um, there's no real like magnifying effect. I've heard people um, say something like that where water droplets can kind of magnify the energy of the sun. Um, I don't really think that's the case, to be perfectly honest. I do think that there's some cause for concern if you're dealing with, you know, compounds that are insoluble that are present inside of the water that you're applying, like carbonates, for example. If you've got well water that's very high TDS and it's not treated and it's not filtered. Doing foliar sprays of that could result in some kind of damage because what ends up happening is as the outer layer of the leaf dries, the minerals that are present inside of that water end up not being absorbed properly by the plant and they tend to hang out on the outer layers of the leaf. So as the water evaporates and the leaf surface dries off, there progressively begins to be a little bit of salt formation that happens. And it's really that salt formation that can you know, create some problems for the plants. If you have organic acids, if you've got amino acids, or if you've got some chelated forms of nutrients, those typically get absorbed pretty rapidly through the leaf surfaces, and doing foliar sprays with the lights on is, generally speaking, not an issue. Um, obviously, it makes sense you know, to test on a small number of plants first, and maybe turn the lights down a little bit, maybe at 50% if you've got the ability to adjust the light intensity, but if you've never done something like that before, or if you're curious to see if the nutrients that you have are available through the leaf surfaces, that's a good practice. Pick a small number of plants, turn the lights down a little bit, spray the plants during the middle of the day, and see what happens. And then from there, 
work your way up to gradually becoming more and more comfortable feeding your plants um, with the lights on doing foliar sprays. I think it can, in a lot of ways it can actually be highly beneficial because water itself has a very high heat capacity. It can absorb a lot of heat. Um, and this is important on days where it's very, very hot. In fact, I remember a couple of years ago here in Washington, it was very hot, you know, maybe two or three years ago in August, it was something like 110 degrees. And we typically don't get that hot here in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, for us, a really hot day is like 85 to 90 degrees. So for us to be sitting at 110 was like freakishly hot. And I remember going outside, I was growing some zucchini and cucumbers at the time. And I remember going outside and I foliar sprayed my plants with a calcium chelate. It was 110 degrees outside. It was 1 p.m. smack dab in the middle of the day you know, in the middle of August and the sun was directly overhead. I mean, they could not have gotten any more intense. Um, But because the chelate that I was spraying was 100% available for the plants to take up, it didn't burn them at all. And I used a pretty hefty dose. I used a dose that was somewhere between 80 to 100 milliliters per gallon, which is astronomical. I mean, I would typically for this calcium chelate, I would recommend people use it um, at the rate of maybe 10 to 20 milliliters per gallon. And I ended up using it at 80 to 100 milliliters per gallon, which is crazy high concentration. So if there was any kind of phytotoxicity associated with that compound itself, it would have manifested itself within a matter of minutes because the leaf surface dried out within 10 minutes, but the plants actually looked a little bit more perky. They looked a little bit more uppity. And I I attribute part of that effect that I saw to the fact that I sprayed water on the leaf surface. So all of that heat, the leaf surface temperature, it was just baking in the sun. It was getting scorched and it wasn't doing too well. Of course, I come and give it a cool spray of water, that water soaks up that heat just like a sponge, and the leaf surface cooled down dramatically. Now, instead of the engine overheating within plants, now we've brought that engine back to its operational temperature range. Now it's just kind of cruising along through the rest of the day. So I would say there's some real benefits associated with the timing of application being the middle of the day. If you have those types of stressors where it's very hot and the light intensity is very high, and you know you have a good fully chelated product that's not going to cause phytotoxicity issues. That's good to know. This reminds me of a conversation we had with Jorge Cervantes. I actually didn't have, get a chance to um, to talk to him about it. I had him on the From the Stash podcast. That episode is being released in a couple weeks here. But one of the things that I wanted to talk to him about, couldn't talk to him about, was reverse foliar feeding. So I actually have a little excerpt from his Grower Bible book. And oh, I'd like to get your thoughts on it because since it relates to foliar feeding. And it's talking about clones. It says the clones from the lower branches root easiest because they contain more of the proper hormones. Clones quickly develop a dense system of roots when stems have a high carbohydrate and low nitrogen concentration. So it's recommended to reverse foliar feed, which will leach nutrients from leaves, especially nitrogens. To reverse foliar feed, fill a spray with clean water and mist mother heavenly. Every morning for three to four days, older leaves may turn light green. Growth slows as nitrogen is used in carbohydrates build. So my interpretation of this is if you're just spraying water on the leaves, it's actually impacting it in a way where nitrogen is being used up a little bit more. Is there any truth to that or is this kind of outdated information? I think it's a little bit outdated information, particularly the idea that the lower branches tend to root out easier. Um, it's very well established and known now that it's actually the meristematic tissue, the apical meristem, that contain, contains the highest concentration of auxins, which are the primary rooting hormones. Most growers are familiar with these little gels that they get, um, root gels. They dip a cut inside of it, and it kind of coats that, um, you know, the, the, the actual stem in the cutting. So that is a synthetic rooting hormone called indole-3-butyric acid. The natural analog, what that synthetic version is trying to replicate is a natural rooting hormone called indole-3-acetic acid, which is the primary auxin. And as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, acetates are the most abundant metabolite in nature. Here's an example of what what I'm talking about. The primary growth hormone in plants is called indole-3-acetic acid. It's an acetic acid residue, basically. So it's important to keep that in mind. But yeah, that is going to be most concentrated at the apical meristem. Um, And those tend to have the most vigorous growth associated with them anyways. The lower branches tend to not grow as fast as the top portion of the canopy. The top portion of the canopy is the one that gets the majority of the transpiration stream. So all that good nutrition that's being lifted up from the roots, it's actually being preferentially transported to that apical meristem, the newest, smallest site of growth, so that it can constantly uh, provide a, a stable supply of building blocks of nutrients and elements to feed the growth of the plant. And so if you can capture a snapshot of that, you get a, you get a snapshot 
And by snapshot, I actually mean, you know, you take a cut off a plant that's very healthy, growing very vigorously, very rapidly. Those are the types of characteristics that you're likely to see come out of that, um, the cutting itself. And there are strategies that I've seen work out pretty well, where if you take care of your mom plants with a particular combination of foliar sprays, you can actually load those rooting hormones up inside of the plant so that when you take the cut, it actually has precursors for indole 3 acetic acid inside of it. So you don't need that um, gel anymore. You don't need to dip your cuts or your clones and wait, you know, seven to 10 days for them to root out. You can actually put that natural compound inside of the plants. It gets absorbed through the foliar spray. And about 15 to 20 minutes later, you take a cut. And then everything inside of that cut is going to be exactly what the plant needs to then propagate new roots and to grow out successfully. And usually growers will save a couple of days instead of seven to 10 days on uh, rooting, we, you know, might see about five to seven days instead. No, I'm going to have to try that a little shortcut there, a little grow hack there. Yeah. The amount of stuff that we have learned over the years. I mean, that quote that I mentioned was from a book that was written in 2006 and we have learned so much since 2006. It's awesome. The amount of information that we've uncovered through science and just regular experiments has been exciting. It's really exciting. And I'm excited to see what happens here in the future. I'm going to hit you with two more, and I saved the two funnest ones for last. For some, they might seem completely outrageous. Others, they say that it's legitimate. Let's hear your take on this. Music for plants. Does playing music for your plants help with plant growth? I've also heard that playing bird chirping noises helps with plant growth, whether it be, a I don't know if it's the stomata opening or, or what, but those are a couple things I've heard. What's your take on that? It's a really interesting topic, and I'll say that the um, the underlying logic was actually developed in the late 1980s. There was a researcher, um, Don Carlson, I think was his name, at University of Minnesota, I want to say, if my memory serves correctly. But anyways, a, 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 you know, a researcher in 1986 um, had put forward this idea that the stomata themselves could be, the, the conductance of the stomata, meaning the opening and the closing of the stomata, could be influenced by um, sound frequencies. And so what he did was he exposed those plants to 3,000 hertz to 5,000 hertz, which basically mimics a bird chirp in the morning. And what he found was over 15 years of research, I believe it was, that there is in fact a correlation between playing noises, bird chirps, maybe music even to some extent, and the overall impact that it has on the, the growth of the plants. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of back up one step and say that plants are remarkably sensitive to their environment. They are exceptionally capable of taking in a variety of different inputs. They're trying to measure and sense every possible nook and cranny of reality that's external to them because again they don't have a choice. They can't like get up and move around if the environment's not ideal. So they're always trying to figure out what's going on in the environment around them. They're taking in as many data points that they possibly can. Um, and with that being said, they are sensitive to sound waves that come through them. Um, with specifically in reference to the way that the stomata um, open and close, it's it's less to do with the physical opening and physical closing of the stomata, and more to do with the maximum size of the stomata being opening. It's maximum conductance. How how open does it actually get? Um, think about that like a fuel injector for a race car. You know, if you're trying to create more horsepower inside of the system, you need those fuel uh, injectors to squirt more fuel for every second that the engine is operational and so this kind of effectively translates to the way that the stomata open and close because if you have stomata open a little bit further even if it's a 10 to 15 percent increase in the conductance of the stomata then um you know you could theoretically achieve a 10 to 15 percent increase in productivity in the plants i will say that this has been studied extensively and it's not just like this one factor that determines it all because you know ultimately photosynthesis and even stomatal conductance is driven by a very fine-tuned balancing act. Plants will open and close selectively based on a number of different things that occur. During the wintertime, you know, the sun's still out, but maybe some certain species of plants aren't growing because to them it's less about the exposure to the sun and more about what temperature it is, right? And then in some other cases, plants are very sensitive to photoperiod triggers. This is how they initiate flowering. And so there's all of these different influencing variables that ultimately kind of converge together and that's the final response that the plant has but if you have everything kind of dialed in if you have good temperature good humidity um it's very it's very true that exposing your plants to the right frequencies 
can actually make a, a difference in their growth overall. And I think that's possible to measure. Um, I think people maybe have taken it a little bit outside the context of how that theory was initially developed and how it's been tested. Um, but it's certainly true to say that plants will respond to frequencies just like they respond to frequencies of light. They'll respond to frequencies of sound. That's interesting. Yeah, I heard a couple things that relate to this singing to your plants. So kind of along the lines of uh, playing music for your plants. But I've heard about this uh, old wives tale or something. It was this lady who sung to her plants and then the other plants she didn't sing to. And she saw better growth in the plants that she sung to. Well, come to find out it was just the carbon dioxide that she was emitting, Mm -hmm. you know, from her, her exhale. That was contributing to the the growth. It wasn't actually the the singing that did it. So I thought that was kind of funny to to bring up. I'm not sure if you've heard of of that one or not. I have, yeah. I also wanted to bring up in regards to playing music for your plants that the dB would have to be crazy loud in order for it to be any impact. The equivalent of a jet engine going off. That's when uh, you know it has to be that loud in order for it to actually make an impact to the plant. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've heard that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, so there's a branch of science called cymatics, and it's basically the effect that sound frequencies have on the formation of, um, you know, like on geometric patterns that can be formed. So the idea basically is like you've got a subwoofer and you put a little bit of salt on top of the subwoofer. And depending on what frequency is being played, it will generate a different kind of, you know, geometry, I guess you could say. Um, A lot of it is, is pretty fascinating. It's interesting to see what exactly happens. But it's certainly true that um water will respond to certain types of sound frequencies you know you can kind of change the geometry of of water so to speak and so i imagine there's a similar mechanism that could actually be at play here you know a lot of this stuff is very very subtle and very nuanced um and a lot of it is just like maybe considered a little bit taboo and we just don't have the instrumentation that's sensitive enough for us to be able to accurately measure some of this type of stuff so the um general consensus right now in the scientific community is probably that it's a little bit esoteric more than it is practical but there have been a lot of really good research articles that have been coming out especially recently that kind of bridge the gaps in our understanding because they have more sensitive machinery now that it's possible for us to make these measurements and kind of you know separate the signal from the noise in some other cases like what you just mentioned you know the singing of that the, this lady she sang to her plants it was actually the co2 that she released which caused the increase in yield and so that that's, there's some signal there and then there's some noise there too. And I think being able to peel it apart is what we're kind of getting to a spot of being able to do. Um, and, and certainly there's good reason to think that plants are going to respond to this type of stuff. I mean, they kind of evolved, they co-evolved, they attract pollinators like birds and like other, you know, uh, bees, for example. And so it's, it stands to reason that they could also, maybe there's some electromagnetic interaction there too. Um, I think this was actually something that was determined to be true with uh, the way that lavender um, interacts with bees. I guess lavender, if I recall correctly, um, the study was demonstrating that lavender actually, em- lavender plants emit a particular frequency. It's not something that you can hear. It's not an audible frequency, but it's still a frequency that gets emitted and it allows the bees to navigate towards the f- the flower that's ready to be, uh, the nectar is ready to be harvested out of that particular flower. And when the bee harvests nectar out of that bud, and it flies away, the electromagnetic frequency is no longer there. It's maybe turned off for about one minute to two minutes while that bud, you sort of, you know, the nectar kind of fills that bud. And again, I, I may be butchering the explanation overall of what this study demonstrated, but the idea was basically that, yeah, plants are emitting, if not noises that are audible to the human ear, there's still frequencies that they're putting out there in the surrounding space around them to try to attract these pollinators. Some of those frequencies are not, um, compounds you know we often associate attracting pollinators with the production of volatile compounds things that we can actually smell and this is true it does work like that but there's also something to be said about maybe other ways of attracting beneficial pollinators and i think this opens up a discussion around these electromagnetic things that we're starting to be able to measure and quantify and better understand um so yeah there's something there for sure that's incredible that's super super interesting it reminds me of uh electroculture. And that's the last one we're going to talk on, uh, talk about today. You know, I don't have a, a, a lot of knowledge about electroculture. I just see these TikTok videos and Instagram reels where these guys are like sticking things into the ground and attaching to the plant. And can you explain to us what electroculture is? And is there any value to it? Does it actually work? Or is this like not something that works whatsoever? 
Yeah, and electroculture is interesting because, you know, like we just talked about with um, with bird chirps and with noises, you know, that came out of a university in the in the 1980s, you know, so there was someone that did actually did a lot of work, 15 years worth of research, and he was able to demonstrate and, and you know, prove pretty much that there is something at play here. Um, whether or not he was 100% right is less relevant than the fact that he discovered something worth exploration. You know, there's definitely something going on. Let's try to characterize it. Let's try to figure out what's happening. Electroculture is a little bit older, um, probably goes back to like the mid 1800s, maybe the late 1800s. People were trying to figure out if electrical fields had any kind of impact on plant growth. And, you know, keep in mind, this is before we even knew or, you know, had a very good understanding of NPK fertilizer. We had no idea what the essential elements were for plant growth. We didn't know calcium from phosphorus back then, you know, the stuff was characterized much later. But the idea basically is that with electroculture, you're creating an electrical field for the plants. Typically, it's a piece of copper wire or copper tubing that's used. Um, and this electrical field will impact plant growth or benefit plant growth. Um, I think a lot of people misunderstand what is actually going on. There are some benefits that can be associated with it, but there's so many different like you know variables that could happen. Like if this, then that. If that, then this. There's all these like dependencies that get formed. Um, I think when we're talking about strictly, you know, electroculture is, is intended to create an electrical field. Okay. So let's look at that. What happens when you subject um, soil particles to an electrical field? Well, if you have ionized compounds, ionized elements like ionized calcium or ionized magnesium or whatever, those ions actually get affected by the electrical field and they can actually move a little bit differently. And so the idea basically is that, yeah, electrical fields can actually dovetail into nutrient metabolism in plants at large. But then the modifier for that is like, yeah, but what if you don't have ionized particles in your, or you don't have ionized atoms inside of your soil? Because mostly the soil is not full of, you know, ionized particles. We're, we're dealing with like mineralized forms of nitrogen, for example, not ionized forms of nitrogen. We're dealing with complexes that are more or less stabilized. We have this sort of like thing, charge balance thing figured out. If you amend your soil with calcium sulfate, you're not dealing with ionized calcium at that point. And so the electrical field is maybe a little bit less relevant overall. I think people also misunderstand the electrical field by thinking that it directly feeds photosynthetic pathways. And that is actually not how it works at all. Um, plants use the power of the sun. They, you know, convert um, light energy into chemical energy through the electron transport chain. But the electron transport chain and how it's evolved to work in plants is much different than a piece of copper wire and electricity that flows in that copper wire, the two, like very little connective tissue between the two of them. And I think it's also worth pointing out that copper itself is considered a micronutrient inside of plants. Yes, it's used for its electrochemical um, properties. I believe this is something we had talked about on your show last episode, but it's accumulated in small concentrations in the plants. And, you know, my suspicion there is that if there was some real benefit associated with this generation of electric field, that could help stimulate plant growth, nature probably would have found a way to incorporate it into primary metabolism a little bit further and to a more, you know, deep extent than it currently is inside of plants. Um, for a very long time now, you know, preceding the existence of any human on earth, um, plants have been doing this photosynthesis thing with no help at all from copper wires that have been stuck into the ground and generating electrical fields. Um, electrical fields can also impact the um, functioning of certain like protein complexes and certain enzymes. But again, these types of things are typically not found in nature. And so plants have not really evolved ways to optimize being exposed to these electrical fields in a way that like massively increases their yield or quality. Um, that's why the results that you see out there are so mixed. Some people swear by electroculture because they have 25 foot tall corn plants and the ones that didn't get electroculture are only four or five feet tall. But then there's other people who do the exact same studies basically and they find no difference associated with it so i would say it's not one of those things that's like a primary driver i'd say if if you have ionized nutrition that could benefit from being exposed to an electrical field then sure you'd, you'd see some benefit as far as nutrient metabolism goes but it's not like this hidden portal where you can access another level of your plant's performance altogether i think that's that's a little bit of a myth or a misconception um but you know there's again there's something interesting to be um, studied here and looked at in greater detail, but I do think we need to better characterize what exactly these electrical fields are 
and how they work in the context of nutrient metabolism, um, enzyme activity, and certainly the biosynthesis of some secondary metabolites that, that might accumulate in higher concentrations. But I don't think there's anything that's really conclusive out there that proves it one way or another. Um, ultimately, plants have electron transport chains, but that's fundamentally different than the way that copper conducts electricity and creates an electrical field. It would be interesting to see some future studies that come out because I know people are studying it and I know people are sort of using it. And so I look forward to seeing what uh, what people come out with in the future. Wow, what an episode. This has been uh, this has been awesome. I think it might actually be the longest episode yet. We usually don't go this long, but I wanted to continue because I was just so intrigued by this conversation. And uh, we had a long list of uh, things here. And I think we touched upon a whole bunch of different things that is really going to be valuable to the audience. So I appreciate you coming on today. And I have a feeling that people in the comments are going to be requesting a part three. And I would love to open the invitation up right now to have you come back on for a part three in the future. And I'd love to open up the invite to the audience to leave some questions in the comments section for part three. So questions you have for Nick, it can be anything. It can be in regards to any of the topics we had here today. Also, it could be carbon. You also have plant nutrition. Nick has a wealth of knowledge in many different areas. So fire off some questions down in the comment section below, and maybe I'll use them in a future episode with Nick. Nick, thanks so much for coming on here. Uh, just a reminder that coupon code Mr. Grow it works on his website, rootedleaf.com. Pick yourself up some nutrients and uh, yeah, save some coin with my discount code. Nick, let the people know how they can find you. And do you have anything upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Oh man, we've been staying so busy. Um, we had the busiest month of November and December that we've ever had. And it's nice kind of growing. <clears throat> you know, we're in 48 different states now and um, we're picking up some interest from distributors, large, large distributors too. So it's, it's fun staying busy. Um, but for those of you who are interested in reaching out and learning more, you can uh, get in touch with me on Instagram. Uh, the Rooted Leaf is our Instagram. And then check out our website, rootedleaf.com. We have a ton of really, really good information about what goes into all of our products. We've got a really big resources page. You'll find all the feed charts that you need. You'll find um, foliar spray charts, SDS sheets, labels, all that good stuff. Pretty much anything that you could ever want as a resource you'll find on there. Um, and feel free to reach out to us on email as well. I think Instagram is a little bit better. Um, I'm typically pretty good about responding quickly to people. So if you have questions, definitely feel free to reach out. I love talking about this stuff. So if there's something that you want to learn about a little bit more, or maybe you want a particular point clarified, um, definitely feel free to reach out and I'll do my best to get back to you guys in a timely manner. Awesome. And I'll definitely have a link to his Instagram down in the YouTube description section below as well, along with the link to his website. Once again, thanks so much for coming on. I, I truly appreciate it. This has been awesome. And I look forward to doing another talk with you. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.